This is too fun. It's worth getting my Geneva Bible wet. This is uh, uh, the pilgrims wouldn't even call this a dribble. Can you imagine? The pilgrims coming across the ocean and say, well, nobody would show up, you know, there was a dribble today. We won't go to church. <laughs> hey, isn't it fun to be together? Yes. I can't believe I've never seen so many clean-shaven, maskless people in all my life. It's just uh, <laughs> nice to see you all. It's... <laughs> we're, we're growing beards instead, you know. As, as Kirk said, uh, you know, what is it, beard, beard November? Well, we're moving beard November. We are going to do that. But what a joy. What a joy to be with you. It's been about 35, 40 years ago I came here for the first time, met Paul Jaley. So many of those that have gone before for the event that we have today have, have gone to their reward. Verna Hall and Rosalie Slater, two ladies who wrote the Red Books, we call it, are ladies that 70 years ago began to research America's Christian history. And it had been totally forgotten. For over 100 years, the people of America had been taught a, a neo-Marxist view of history that had, had, had swept into the public schools beginning in the 19th century and on into the early 20th century with a man named John Dewey and the founder of progressive public education. And from then through men like Charles Beard and his wife who wrote many volumes, they rewrote American history and they took this story out. Right. They took the story out of the greatest nation the world has ever known built upon the word of God and the first republic since the time of ancient Israel that has been built upon these principles. This is the story the American people do not know today. And until we know that story, how can we possibly restore what we don't know how to restore? Right. And we don't know we even had. If we forget who we are, as Ronald Reagan said, then we will lose the freedom that we enjoy. And we'll grow up or we'll send our, how do you say it? We'll spend our sunset years telling our grandchildren what it was like to live in America when it was free. That's how serious the moment that we live in today is. How many of you know how serious this moment is? Yes. Yes. This is a time to restore and renew our covenants with God. It's a time to restore and renew our understanding of our relationship with Him and one another and with our nation. And as we do, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Amen. I, as my wife says, I always give this the summary of my sermon at the beginning. He said, Marshall, you might as well sit down. You've already said it. But that's, <laughs> what can I say? Um, anyway, it is such a joy to be with you. And, and it's been a joy to be uh, in this movement with men, like, men and women, Paul Jaley and the team that is right here in Plymouth that have been fighting this battle for 20, 30, 50 years and longer that we would restore this pilgrim heritage to the nation. I want to go back with you, since I have a few minutes before Kirk comes, I want to go back with you and review this history, but I want to review it back before the time the pilgrims arrived. I want to take us back to at least Moses and real briefly give you a quick summary of how the covenants have marched through history. Because what you're seeing here is almost exactly 3,000 years from the time that Moses was about to relieve the children of Israel. And he was going to die on a mountaintop, and he was sending the people, as you read in the book of Deuteronomy, across into the promised land. He gave them the strategy that they needed to build a Christian republic. And that strategy was given in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 10, in what is called the Shema. And the Jewish people who are Orthodox today use it, Shema, and their children recite the Shema all the time. We... All of us in the body of Christ and all of us as Americans should re re rehearse that because guess what? What you see on this monument is a, is a repeat of the Shema. It's the basic principles that are laid down there. To do what? It says we must love God and know God as parents. And then we must teach our children in the morning when they rise up and throughout the day and when they lie down at night. And then we are to live out these principles and put them on our forehead and, and, and carry them out in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our parlors and in our front porches. And then it says out to the gates, which is the city gates. So we start in the home. We start in our hearts. And from our hearts out to hospitality to our neighbors. From there out to the city gates where we tell the government the way it ought to be run. Amen. Amen. But you can't go out and tell anybody how it ought to be done if you haven't been doing it at home. 
And if you haven't been doing it at home, then we need to be doing it there, right? Starting with our own hearts and our own families and teaching our own friends. And then we become a force to be reckoned with peacefully, simply saying, let's hold on to the Constitution and the Republic for which it stands, which happens to be built upon the Hebrew Republic from over 3,000 years ago. And what I'm saying, when I say the Hebrew Republic, my people say, well, what do you mean? America's Constitution was built on the Hebrew Republic? I've never heard that. Well, the Founding Fathers all knew that. I mean, even when, when the Constitution was about to be ratified, New Hampshire was the final ninth state. And if New Hampshire didn't ratify it in 1788, it was going to go down in flames. There was going to be no Constitution. And so at the at the convention, when they were down to the final vote, they brought in one person to preach, and his name was Samuel Langton. He was the, he was the actual uh, president of Harvard University before that, and now is the leading pastor in all of New England. They asked him to come in and preach a sermon, and the sermon was specifically, America was built upon the sacred Hebrew Republic, and we will be facing Almighty God if we do not restore and rebuild it on those principles. And guess what? They voted for the Constitution, and we ended up a free nation with the Constitution. Because he preached the principles of the Bible as the foundation for civil government. If the Bible is not the foundation, then you lose the Christian population of the country who thinks that there's no tie between civil government and civil authority and what's going on in the church. And so you have a lot of people in my generation picked up what I call rapture fever, where we kind of thought maybe we could just kind of live in our in our own little lives out here and let the culture go to you know what and it would be okay because you know the Lord's coming soon anyway so we don't have to worry about having children well that's not the way to live if you know what I mean the point is that that as we began to understand now and look back on the Constitution the way it was we say wait a minute God gave us these principles and nothing is changed God is the same yesterday today and forever if the principles given to the Hebrew Republic, which would allow sinful men to live in a society where there could be justice and freedom with a localized, not centralized, system of government where you elect your judges and where you, where you have a Senate and a House and you have the, the, more, the, the people that have wisdom and older around a small group and then the larger group is a House of Representatives representing all the people and then, and then you develop it into local tribes and you don't have a national sitting army that controls everyone and, and the executive only rises up in a time of war. You begin to see that all the ties, as our founding fathers, beginning with the pilgrims, for 150 years in every township in Massachusetts and in Connecticut and down through into Virginia, when they were building their local constitutions, they built it upon these principles of the Hebrew Republic. They built it on the principles of the Ten Commandments. And our, our own presidents throughout the years, even into the 20th century, have said the foundation of America is not Karl Marx, as Truman said and others. It is the Ten Commandments. The Bible is the foundation for liberty and justice and freedom. Five of the Ten Commandments deal with what? Private property, right? And, and you can go on and on with the principles of the commandments, which are fundamental to the very principles that built America's society that respects the individual and protects the individual and the family, not the corporate conglomerate right. at the top, which can mean anything you want it to mean. Each individual is important to God as any other individual, and we must respect individual rights. These principles were all biblical principles, and they were worked into our founding fathers generation so that by the time you get to the constitutional convention and to the winning of the American Revolution John Adams was asked what revolution the American Revolution oh he said that revolution took place in the hearts of the people during the Great Awakening before the revolution ever took place you see what was needed for America to win a war against the greatest army and Navy the world had known to that point was that they first had to have their hearts right with God and they had fallen away from God in the 1720s and 30s and they took a great awakening before America was restored in their hearts and minds to have Christ as their leader as, as Samuel Adams, the leader of the Sons of Liberty right up here as we were studying him with my grandchildren who are all seated here they're coming in from Tennessee we, had to, we have to get these Tennesseans trained in what it is it all started in New England, right? 
<laughs> right. So, anyway, you know, Samuel Adams, well, I forget what Samuel Adams said. I taught my grandkids and I've forgotten Samuel. But, uh, no, he, he is the great example, we'll get to him in a minute, because he uses the strategy of the forefathers' monument. So, oh, Samuel Adams was saved in the Great Awakening under George Whitfield at Harvard in the 1730s. He goes on to become the great patriot who is behind the scenes developing the local strategy of the Campfire Revival in the 1770s called the Committees of Correspondence. It went from town to town to town and the American people rose up understanding these principles together as one. So that the, he knew that was what was necessary before there would be any kind of conflict and even he didn't even want a conflict neither did any of the founders they had to follow matthew 18 and the principles of scripture and go through 10 years of remonstrances 10 years of pleading with the king 10 years of going to their local magistrates before they would even consider it and even after that it wasn't until they were attacked and they were they boarded in their homes and they were being killed at lexington and conquered only as a last resort did they ever go to the place where they had to fight. But when they fight, oh, did they fight. And they won their freedom. But it's a matter of character, isn't it? Yes. It's character and self-government and understanding what the scriptures say and what the scriptures teach as to strategy. I've been in this battle a long time. Uh, I've been the president of the World History Institute now for uh, <coughs> 46 years. A uh, long time, and we've been teaching this since the days of Verna Hall and Rosalie Slater and the days of, of John Talcott. John Talcott is one of the great heroes of Plymouth who actually paid for the Bradford statue. He is, uh, you know, and the Plymouth Rock Foundation came out of his life and ministry, and one of the great men of our time who lived into his hundreds. This, this great hero it was a friend of mine, and what a man. And these are the kinds of people who laid their lives down in this last generation that people like Kirk and I and others could then rise up and simply pass the message on. You are the message. You are the people who carry the covenant. This is not a top-down. This is not a who's got the organization. This is in the heart of every American Christian. There should be an understanding that we are in covenant with God and that God wants to disciple the nations. He said so in the Great Commission, didn't he? In Matthew 28, we're to go and disciple the nations. And Matthew Henry said, to disciple the nations means to make all nations Christian nations. That's our goal. Our goal is not to just, you know, take a, a four spiritual outlook and drop it into China by a billion and in, a, in a balloon and our job is done. No, we want to disciple the nations that the people of China would be free so that they could study their Bibles and understand and live in a biblically-based constitutional republic. I want to see culture as best we can in a sinful world reflect the character and nature of a liberating God. Amen. And if we want that, then we can have it if we will follow God's principles. Because guess what? Covenant keepers win and covenant breakers lose. You just have to stay around long enough to see the end of the story. Amen. Now that's what's so important about going back and remembering. The scripture says the beginning of, how many think we need a revival in America? Yes. How, many, how many of you know the first thing that has to happen before a revival? Many would say prayer. Well, boy, you're right, exactly. If there's no prayer, and there are some prayer warriors out here that have been praying for 50 years, right? And your prayers are, are being answered, and they, they, they do not go void, for sure. But I want to say that, as Jesus put it, he gave us three specific principles that we need to follow. He said to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he said, these are the three things you need to do, Ephesus. You have forgotten your first love. Your first love. Yeah. You've forgotten me. And how do we solve that? He said, remember from whence you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did it first. Do you know why I believe we as Americans have not corporately repented of our sin of abortion, our sin of letting our nation go down and the republic fall apart? It's because we don't remember that God gave us this through the blood of the martyrs and through the sweat and tears and prayers of millions of saints over a period of 3,000 years so we could come to America and express it to the world. We don't know that story. Once we know it, doesn't that make you feel a little bit like... 
Oh God, I need your forgiveness yes. for letting go of the greatest heritage the world has ever known. Mm. It's not that America is perfect. No. We're not perfect at all, but our God is great and he is good and he is yes. gracious. And he gave us the, not only the principles and the way and the strategy, but he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives so that by his grace, we can walk with him and change as we grow. Amen. That is the beauty of revival and awakening when it is a full on awakening. First thing we do in awakening is remember. That's what we're doing tonight. We're remembering how far we've fallen. And there's no better way to remember than to go back to the Gilgal stones. I got a little sidetracked there. I started out talking about Moses. I want to come back to him for a minute now. You notice how I just break into four or five different sermons. Well, that's kind of, that's because I'm a frustrated preacher who wants to do several sermons at once since I only get this kind of audience every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. No, but seriously, isn't it exciting to be able to go back and have a remembrance that is in, that's right here in the largest granite monument in America? Duh. You think maybe God had that planned, right? <laughs> And it's sitting here right in front of us, and the strategy is the strategy of God, the same one that God gave to Moses. And it is that strategy of, of doing exactly what we see happening here with the transformation of the heart, knowing God, loving God, you know, seeing your life transformed by the law of God, living it out into the community and the law, and then, guess what? Then you'll have houses you didn't build, and I'll give you lands you've never seen, and those are the blessings that come according to the covenant. For Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 7 says, for those who love me and keep covenant with me, I shall bless them to a thousand generations. Wow. So when we're talking about covenant, we're not talking about some small thing. We're talking about the blessings of Abraham coming down to your children's children to a thousand generations. Wow, I don't know about you, but I get kind of exciting about that. I could, I could die for something like that because my children's children will go on long after me and they'll live in liberty because... They can look back and say, well, granddad, at least you followed the pilgrims. Remember what was said by our dear Paul Jaley today when he was quoting John Robinson? I love that statement when, when Bradford says in his manuscript, this is William Bradford's manuscript, the greatest political document ever written in the history of mankind, rediscovered in the 1880s after being lost to the probably to the, uh, to the English during the American Revolution. The actual handwritten version was rediscovered and it became a treasure of Massachusetts as now, you can see it in the, uh, or at the Kennedy Library, I think where they have it now. But that, this is a treasure. And it's in here that we read uh, the great principles laid out by William Bradford that the pilgrims lived by. And, and some of his great quotes that just uh, exemplify the things that we're teaching today about a constitutional republic and doing it God's way from the grassroots, from the family up. When you look at William Bradford, as he was about ready to come across the ocean with his pilgrim fathers, he explained, other than the fact that they thought they were going to get filleted by the population when they got here, and they thought most of them would die before they got here. And the fact that even though they did, they felt like, well, they were in a worthy venture. And even if they did, they were doing it for God. And so they're willing to venture out. They gave the reasons they came. And they said, we came for four reasons. And Bradford says, first, they saw by experience that the hardships of the country were such that comparatively few others would join them. And fewer still would bite it out and remain with them. I don't know if I'd bite it out either if I saw friends having their ears cut off and having others being burned at the stake and then inviting them to church saying, why don't you come join our church, you know? It's kind of a tough sell. And they were always saying, do you have a, 